Um, today, we, um, Representative Hornstein is um, presenting House File 1027. If you'd like to uh, go ahead and present your bill. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this is the uh, governor's uh, budget bill uh, as it pertains to the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and I will just uh, ask the um, uh, members of the um, uh, Department of Public Safety leadership to uh, present their budget. And uh, after their, they conclude, um, we'll have questions and answers from the committee. Uh, we have Commissioner Harrington, Colonel Langer, and DVS Director Emma Corey uh, all lined up to speak. And I uh, believe Commissioner Harrington is going first. Uh, is that my, am I correct in that? Yes, sir, you are correct. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner Harrington. Please state your name for the record and um, proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Cagle. I'm John M. Harrington, uh, the, the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, the Department of Public Safety's mission is to serve all Minnesota communities to build by building a safer Minnesota. Uh, we have been working through a process of doing both community outreach and enhanced customer service to try and enhance the mission of public safety, uh, whether that is traffic safety on our uh, roads and highways, uh, safety around the Capitol, which is also one of our responsibilities, uh, and enhancing safety by uh, making sure that we regulate the, the motor vehicle both licensing of the vehicles and the drivers uh, through the Department of Vehicle Services. Uh, today, uh, you're going to hear from Colonel Matt Langer, uh, Colonel of the Minnesota State Patrol, who has done an exceptional job uh, of both traffic enforcement and traffic safety and education, but has also uh, worked to, it really has been uh, my number one and right-hand person as we have tried to make sure that the Capitol itself is safe and secure during uh, these rather uncertain times. You'll also hear from Emma Corey, who is my Director of the, uh, Vehicle Services, uh, and uh, the highlight that we always talk about uh, at, at, at DPS is that we no longer use the words minlars uh, as a verb anymore. Uh, when I came into this office, that was the uh, that was the term. I can't minlars today or bad things were happening. And I think I sent a message out to uh, Representative Hornstein and others that uh, we have powered down minlars. Uh, that the actual servers are being dismantled, uh, and I'm uh, confident that they will never be heard of again, uh, other than as a historical reference. So, uh, as I said, the Department of Public Safety's priority uh, in this budget is really to enhance customer service and accountability. And, and you're going to hear from my staff as they talk about body-worn cameras. Uh, they're going to talk about capital security and real ID. Uh, we are at the Department of Public Safety, a conglomerate. Uh, we are in two different committees. We're in the Public Safety Committee and also on the Transportation Committee. Uh, if you look at us, we are, there are 11 different divisions. On the transportation side, there are, the biggest divisions are both the State Patrol and DVS in terms of the number of staff. Uh, but the Office of Traffic Safety is an absolute, Mike Hansen's vision is absolutely essential in mapping and educating and working with us to try and make sure that highway safety is kept in mind. And, Toward that end, recently we have been doing a, a big speed reduction effort, trying to make sure that the motorists that we have seen out there are literally are doing well in excess of 100 miles an hour because they, uh, for whatever reason, think that, that they can stop their car on a dime in Minnesota weather and Minnesota roads. Um, we need to get them to slow down because their our crash rate is historic uh, and our fatal rate is growing and growing and great and growing. Uh, in addition to that, we have the Office of Pipeline Safety, uh, and then there are dozens of not dozens there are uh, number of other administrative related services that we also operate. On the public safety side, for those, uh, we have alcohol gambling enforcement, which regulates uh, liquor licensed establishments, both bars and liquor stores, uh, but they also regulate all of the gambling, whether it's pull tabs, uh, all the way through casino gambling and slot machines. State Fire Marshal is our state fire investigators and also are the state fire training uh, operations that train all of the firefighters, whether they're professional firefighters and full-time firefighters, as you see in the Twin Cities, or the volunteer firefighters and the on-call firefighters, which make up actually the vast majority of firefighters across the state of Minnesota. The Office of Justice Programs uh, is our victim services unit, uh, and they do both crime risk victims reparations, uh, and also make sure that uh, as there are complaints about the criminal justice system, that we have a place for folks that are not happy with the way the system is working come to. 
ECN, uh, which is probably the, one of the least known operations, uh, run, regulates the 911 system and the interoperability system that allows police, fire, medics, and everybody else to talk to each other across the state of Minnesota, and especially in an emergency. Homeland Security and Emergency Management, uh, which I think is at 345 days of successful operation, uh, where they have been operating, uh, running the COVID, uh, much of the COVID operation with the Department of Health, and then the BCA, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, which is our state investigative agency. Uh, those comprise the Department of Public Safety. For this committee, the ones that we're going to highlight today are the Minnesota State Patrol and the Driver and Vehicle Services. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we are talking about today is our budget overview, and they're really uh, three parts of that. The first one I'll talk about, and then, as I said, Colonel Langer and Emma Corey will talk about the others. Uh, the DPS operating adjustment. Uh, the operating adjustment is what we need in order to be able to uh, pay all the bills that have come up in the interim. So uh, increase in funding necessary for rent. Uh, that goes up whether we wanted to. IT costs. Uh, uh, running the IT, IT structure statewide has a cost. Our legal issues have come up as a cost. Uh, and then compensation, which is a huge piece of this with contract negotiations constantly going on with a variety of different unions and the different groups here. We have to make sure that we have uh, operating under those new guidelines. And so we'll be asking for additional adjustments within our budget there. Uh, next slide. So our operating adjustment, uh, we're looking at a reduction in FY 2021. Uh, that's due to the state hiring freeze and uh, several other operating efficiencies over the last year. Part of those you'll hear from Director Corey as we talk about um, in part because of uh, the shutdown of many DVS offices and exam stations due to COVID. Um, there was a period of time where we were uh, we had far less operating expenses, and so we had some operating efficiencies there. And then as we came out of that, uh, we had to figure out how would we do driver's license testing at others in a COVID environment? How do you put people into a car, far less than six feet uh, separation, uh, even with masks and things along that lines, and do it in a safe way and still keep up with the demand? And there was a ex extremely high demand for driver's license tests. And then there are also some really essential driver's license tests, like the Class C commercial driver's licenses we needed to make sure we got done in time for farming and things along that lines. As I said, we're looking at increases in funding also as we move forward on compensation, rent, and IT, and legal. Uh, there's a $220,000 reduction in FY 2021, uh, but an increase of $824,000 in FY 22, and um, $1.4 million dollar uh, in fiscal year 23, which is an ongoing request. Next slide. Uh, at this time, I would turn it over to uh, Colonel Matt Langer, unless there are questions from the committee for me. Welcome, Colonel Langer. If you could state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thanks, Commissioner. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Matt Langer, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as Chief of the Minnesota State Patrol. And my uh, opportunity before you today is to go through some of the budget items that we have in the governor's budget that we'll be pursuing this year. The first thing that you'll see, and I know many of you have been members of the Transportation Committee for a long time, and you know full well what the Minnesota State Patrol does, but you can see our mission statement on the screen. And we are all about traffic safety. That's the bulk of what we do, but it's not everything that we do. There's a few buzzwords in our mission statement. Three of them that I point out all the time are assistance, education, and enforcement. That really describes the majority of our work across the state of Minnesota. We do an incredible amount of assistance, both to people that run out of gas or have a flat tire or their car breaks down or the other law enforcement agencies that require help along the way. And we focus really strongly on education along with enforcement because it is our belief that we won't be successful solving traffic safety problems through education alone, nor will we be successful solving traffic safety problems through enforcement alone, but through both of those together with assistance, we can provide the service that Minnesotans have come to expect from the Minnesota State Patrol all the way back to 1929. Next slide, please. Just jumping right in in no particular order to our budget request here. The first item is a civil unrest response change item. And this relates both to the general fund, the work around the state capital and the capital complex um, that we've had in this fiscal year, 
particularly increased since Jan uh, January when we had the insurrection in Washington, D.C., and the related issues we've had around our own capital complex with the various protest events that have really been unrelenting over the past year or more. Um, so you'll see a general fund increase for FY21 and then a trunk highway fund increase in, the, in FY21 as well to help us cover the costs that we anticipate needing uh, related to the Derek Chauvin trial with jury selection starting March 8th. I will say, Madam Chair, members of the committee, that both of these numbers continue to be in flux somewhat because the planning efforts continue. And so there's a, uh, some moderation and changes that's occurring as we speak with these numbers. Uh, and the closer we get to some of the events happening, the better off we'll be with the projections. But uh, both of these items are really important for us to get out of the fiscal year in sound shape. The next item is a 8.4% salary increase for troopers. One of the things that happened legislatively during a special session last year was an increase uh, directed by the legislature for state troopers and state troopers only to receive an 8.4% increase to their salary. Along with that increase came one-time funds to get us through this fiscal year. And what we are needing are the tails for that increase to continue into the future so you can see the, the um, calculated cost of the tails into the future for those increases. And I'll note that as the commissioner outlined, although the total number is about 5.9 million, that is split across the funds that are appropriated to the state patrol, including the general fund, the trunk highway fund, which includes commercial motor vehicle enforcement, and then HUTD, which is primarily our vehicle crimes unit group. The third item on the screen is an academy carry forward piece uh, of legislation that we're seeking. It basically allows for a reduction in this year's uh, appropriation and allows us to carry that into FY22. The reason for this is just simply that our academy got delayed because we didn't receive the funding that we needed during the regular special session. We received that funding during, during one of the subsequent special sessions. And so that put our academy timeline behind where it would normally be. And so we will have these cadets hired. They'll be in the Lido Academy this summer, but they will not be graduated and on the road by June 30th. And so since we'll have them hired and then in the midst of their training, we're seeking the ability to carry forward 1.718 million from FY21 to FY22, because that is the projected cost to get those cadets to graduation in the new fiscal year. Next slide, Jordan. Uh, the, this top item here is a, a big ticket item for us. It's state patrol body worn cameras. Uh, we are uh, quickly becoming antiquated as a law enforcement agency, both in Minnesota and across the country because state troopers do not currently have body worn cameras. And so this line item, this change item would allow us to outfit the entire Minnesota State Patrol both the state troopers and the capital security officers and the commercial motor vehicle inspectors, the non-sworn positions that interact with the public with body-worn cameras. You can see the cost is about 4.5 million the first year and 3.6 ongoing. The first year with some deployment costs a little bit more, uh, but we're talking about seven to 800 devices actually deployed. So it's a significant undertaking, but it's one that's really important and I might add, is one that the troopers and the capital security officers and the commercial vehicle inspectors are, are wanting. They're eager for them. They're proud of their work and they want to, uh, uh, as the commissioner stated, lean into that accountability both on their behavior and holding accountable those that they interact with. The second item is capital security enhancements. We've had great discussions thanks to the Capital Security Advisory Committee and we've uh, presented some options uh, that, that have been received well by that body. Uh, this is a total of 8.47 in the FY22 and a little over 4 million in FY23. This adds 34 dedicated positions, including 21 of those being sworn state troopers. It also includes some technology pieces to mobile devices so we can better track assets. And it includes some state-of-the-art training components too to really uh, do our best to learn what has occurred both in Minnesota and across the country and implement what we have found by researching events into the current training methodology of our capital security unit um, who does a great job of managing the daily 
work of the state capitol and the complex related to people who come and visit, school groups that come and visit once buildings open up again after COVID, the legislators that do their work there, and the many, many other people that, that have business in the capitol complex. The next piece is, is a minor one, but it's important and it's the last one that I'll cover. Um, we have discovered recently that uh, there, we don't have um, a statutory mechanism to get rid of abandoned cash. And so if, uh, if a vehicle is found on the side of the road and it has money in it, or there's unclaimed cash as a result of a vehicle that was forfeited from an arrest, um, there's a variety of reasons that we as an agency come across money that is abandoned. In other words, there's, there's nobody that claims it as their own. And so we have great policy and controls in place to deposit those abandoned funds and to track them, but there's no statutory ability to use those funds. And so what we're looking for here is the authority to deposit those funds into the general fund. The revenue is currently at about 70,000 and we estimate it's about $15,000 per year um, that, that needs to be cleaned up so it can go somewhere uh, other than in the account where it's sort of trapped right now. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'd be happy to answer any questions on those budget items for the State Patrol. Thank you, Colonel Langer. And I see we do have one question for Representative P from Representative Petersburg, but if we could just um, finish this group, would that be okay if we came back to you, Representative Petersburg? Absolutely. All right, so next on the agenda is Director Emma Corey, if you wanna just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Representative Hornstein, my name is Emma Corey and I am the Driver and Vehicle Services Director. Thank you for this opportunity to present on our budget for DVS. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, I want to start by saying that I am proud on behalf of DVS, on behalf of our deputy de registrars, as well as Minute and our FAST vendor to say that we successfully launched the Minnesota Drive system on November 16th of 2020. And uh, we are uh, moving forward with this budget request based on the technology pl platform that MinDrive provides. So on this particular slide, I want to focus on two things that this budget request is based on. One, our focus is on optimizing the technology that Minnesota Drive has provided us and providing that increased level of online options and customer service options for both our business partners as well as our customers. The second is our focus on really challenging ourselves at DVS to build some operational efficiencies, staffing efficiencies, space efficiencies. And basically COVID, was a forced pilot for us. It allowed us to see what we could do and the efficiencies that we could really reap from a consolidated efficient model. So the basis of this budget request, two things, more technology options for customers and two, greater operational efficiencies. Jordan, we can go to the next slide. So the first item on our budget request is the real ID temporary funding. We are requesting a one-time allocation appropriation of $2.4 million for fiscal year 22. You already appropriated this to us in the last year, but as you are aware, the federal real ID out in the, the um, timeline has been shifted a year. So we are asking for that funding in fiscal year 22 so that we can bring on the temp staff, meet the needs of Minnesotans and get them travel ready by October 1st, 2021. Of course, this is a one-time request. The next one is focused on our staffing and operations. This request is a $5.9 million request in FY22 and then approximately 2.9 uh, going into the, into the future. 
This is focusing on physicians. So as I said, the Minnesota Drive system came out of VTRS funds. That team, core team of eight that will allow us to enhance and build on that technology needs to now move on to operating funds. So these, this, these dollars are asking for funding for the MinDrive team. It is asking for cross-trained staff that can work with issuing titles, issuing driver's licenses. Our focus is to optimize staff so they can help with wherever the busy season is. Same way for inspectors, we're asking for vehicle inspectors. These are folks, if they can do the dealer inspections, our examiners can focus on road tests. So our focus moving forward is to optimize and cross train our staff so that we can really optimize efficiencies. We did that during COVID and we got results that we have never had before. And we hope to be able to do that. So this amount that you see in front of you, 5.9 million, greater uh, amount of investment upfront because this also includes infrastructure needs. We want to relocate the Wilmers exam station location. We have grown out of that location. We need a bigger space. We are looking at three locations that we want to add as full service uh, stations so that we can do transactions as well as knowledge tests, as well as road tests. So we're talking about a consolidated model with greater services. And that is the intent. And so greater expense in the first year and then more of um, a, 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 a lower expense in, in future years. We're also talking about a mobile service unit, a unit that can go to correctional facilities or housing uh, locations where folks can be able to get their services met out of a mobile uh, service delivery unit. So um, we're looking at translations of the driver services manual. So several things that are in here, but the focus being on being able to put in some operational efficiencies and offer better customer service across the state in all corners of the state. Next slide. The next one is focusing on the license plate fee restructure. This particular one is focused on removing our dependency on the highway user, uh, the tax fund, and, and and basically, basically removing the 8.26 that comes out of the HUTD fund and um, going with a standard $13.50 or $15 for license plate fees. This fee increase will remove our dependence on HUTD and allow that to focus on road projects, bridge projects, but our focus would be to be able to get that 8.236 with uh, license fees that would cover the entire cost of license plates. This is, um, um, and the next one is partial payment for driver's license re reinstatement. This particular one, what it does is that it allows that partial payment option for all, partial payment option for all uh, those that, all individuals with an impaired driving arrest. And so what this will do is it does charge for a reinstatement fee. It will, uh, it will increase revenues, but it will also increase equity in the way of allowing people the option to not have to pay that large amount in one sum, but in installments. The expanded lifetime veteran plates. As you know, several of these veteran plates are lifetime plates, but Place like Proud to be a Veteran, American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, Veterans Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Wars, many of these are seven-year seven place. This will, across the board, make these lifetime place a, a gesture of respect for our veterans. Next slide, please. We the OLA has, uh, as a result of an OLA audit, there are some recommendations. As you know, we have data requests for motor vehicle data as well as driver's license data. 
at the current time, we charge a fee for one and we don't for the other. What this does is it allows us to charge a uniform fee across the board for motor vehicle data, as well as for driver's license data. It is expected to bring in a revenue of, of 72,000 roughly uh, each year. The next one focuses on temporary trip permits. And this one at the current time, um, Minnesota companies, our own companies are bearing the brunt of a higher uh, rate for our trip permits as compared to pass through out of state commercial vehicle companies. And so what this particular uh, change does, it allows to have the same permit, same trip permit fee for all carriers. And that does expect to bring in a revenue of 152,000, 168,000 in future years. And finally, this last one is focusing on the citizen crash report. Uh, I won't go into too much detail because I know my colleague, uh, Colonel Langer is here and he can speak to it. And we are basically requesting, DBS is requesting to eliminate the citizen crash report. Colonel Langer, if you might, wouldn't mind uh, speaking to this and the value of uh, eliminating the crash report at this time. Colonel Langer. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, members of the committee and Director Corey, I appreciate the opportunity just to weigh in on this. Um, you know, the citizen crash report has been something that has lived in statute for many, many years. And I think once upon a time it had a purpose in state government, but that purpose is no longer valid. And so to be quite candid with uh, members of this committee, right now uh, we're requiring citizens to fill out a crash report after they've been involved in a crash where it's required. And they have to fill that in or go online. And then once those reports are received in DVS, they're not used for anything. And that's just the candid answer. And so this is, a, I think, a good piece of legislation, in our opinion, that helps streamline some things and make it easier for those citizens who are involved in a crash to have one less thing that they have to do, uh, especially since it no longer has a purpose that is uh, meaningful. Thank you. Director Corey. And with that, I will um, pass it back to Commissioner Harrington. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like we're ready to take some questions. So first up on our list is um, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I have a, a question for uh, Corporal Langer and then uh, for, for uh, Mindrive as well. But my question is um, this next set of uh, cadets coming through this summer and when they graduate, how many do we have in the class this year? And will that then give us a full complement of uh, officers or will we still be short on personnel? And then I have a follow-up question for Mindrive. Colonel Langer. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Petersburg, uh, good question. So right now we have 31 cadets at Camp Ripley. We hired them as part of the traditional hiring process. We also have 30 cadets right now working through the academic process before they can enter our academy and they're in the LEADO process. Um, it's kind of a widely held misnomer that there is a complement at the Minnesota State Patrol of X number of troopers. We don't have a complement, but what I take as very serious in my responsibility is the, is the uh, quest to hire as many troopers as I can within the appropriation that we have from the legislature. Uh, and of course, there are many other things that go into the work of the Minnesota State Patrol, but the bread and butter, the backbone of who we are as an agency is, of course, the, the state troopers, uh, followed closely by our non-sworn staff that do a great job supporting all the work of the troopers. Uh, and so right now, we're doing the best we can to hire uh, replacements for all of the vacant positions that we have, but we're not actively attempting to grow the state patrol other than in that capital security change item request. And, the recruitment environment is difficult, as members of this committee, I'm sure, are aware for a variety of reasons, but uh, I'm still um, really energized by the number of men and women who are eager to join the ranks of the State Patrol. Representative Petersburg. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Langer. I appreciate that information. Um, getting back to the then the uh, license plate fee increase, the $2, uh, I have a couple of questions regarding to that, that whole section there. 
Uh, one is, is where is that $2 going to? Uh, because I'm also concerned about uh, deputy registers and the last oil, uh, some legislative uh, auditors report that indicated that everybody knows that there's more work being done at the deputy register office uh, without getting any additional uh, fee structure. So, so how does that work into uh, this particular budget? Where do those $2 go? And, and how do we compensate for um, the deputy registers? Director Corey? Madam Chair and members, uh, Representative Petersburg, thank you for the question. Yes, um, the, the calculation to bring it to 1350 and 15 across the board for our license uh, plate fees uh, that fund, that calculation is exactly based on an $8.236 million appropriation that we currently get from HUTD. So it would replace the 8.236 from the HUTD fund, and it will cover the current cost of license plates. We, as you know, we use MinCore to print and uh, print and um, mail our, our, our license plates. And so that is the true cost of uh, the production and the, and the mailing uh, and shipping and handling of um, license fees, license mm -hmm. plate fees. Representative Petersburg. Uh, uh, thank you. Then I'll, I'll have just one follow-up call comment, ma Ms. Madam Chair, is that, so it sounds like there's not gonna be eight million dollars in this budget proposal coming out of HUTD, does that mean that HUTD will have that many more dollars available for other projects? And it still doesn't deal with how we deal with the uh, deputy registers who are, are doing more work for basically the same amount or less. Thank you, Madam Chair. Director Corey, did you have any response to that? It is the, it's true that, uh, that that amount will be available in HUTD for other projects. Yes, it will not be. So there will be $8.236 million additional in the HUTD for allocation elsewhere. Thank you. Next up, we have Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Director Corey, uh, you had mentioned, and um, Commissioner Harrington had also mentioned about the uh, the road test was something that we've talked about in the past. Um, can you just give us a little bit more detail or maybe send me um, some stuff offline too? Um, you'd said, if I heard you correctly, you're looking at adding three new locations and you want additional funding to consolidate um, the model of the exam stations. Um, so I'm a little curious about that. That's the first I've heard of it, which um, could be good. Could um, Maybe I have concerns, I'm not sure. Uh, but then also uh, talk to us, uh, give us an update about the scheduling of road tests. Um, how, how far out are we scheduling um, and are, are we meeting our statutory requirements on that? Uh, thank you, Representative Kosnick. And that's also another question I had. I was kind of curious what the consolidated exam station model was. So Director Corey. Absolutely, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Kosnick, and members of the committee, thank you for that question. Uh, several uh, comments uh, that I will try to tie together. So uh, when we talk about our exam station model currently, we have 93 different locations. Many of them are satellite locations, one day a month, one day a week, one, uh, you know, uh, one two days, uh, two days every other month, things like that. So very, very, um, if I may say, not the most efficient way of providing services. What COVID did is we consolidated down and we, it was, it's a lot easier to have 100% focus on health and safety in 15 locations than compromising health and safety in 93 locations. And, and uh, examiners traveling to all these locations. So the consolidation model, what we are looking to is, how do we strategically move to say a 30 or 35 exam station model, which doesn't leave any corner of the state. I have it, uh, you know, I have it planned by, by counties 
and how can we set it up in such a way that no corner of the state has an inordinate amount of burden to travel to their closest exam station. So that's focus on the, on the consolidation. So our hope is to go down to 30 to 35 locations but a lot of these locations were doing either only road tests or only knowledge tests or only transactions. The ones that we focus on will be robust and will have all options. Road tests, online tests, transactions, all of the options. So those exam stations will give you everything you need. And as we are deciding on these, we are looking at where are our partners. As you know, my personal focus has been building a strong relationship with our deputy registrars and our uh, business partners. And so we are looking at where are the deputy registrars because they provide all the transactions. The only thing now with the online tests available as well, the only thing folks need to come to us for is the road test. And the road test you usually do once or twice in your lifetime. So our focus is a model keeping in mind current deputy registrars and the exam stations that we have will have full service, robust um, service delivery. That, that's our focus. And, and uh, Representative Kosnick, I'm happy to send you some more information on that. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Representative or Vice Chair Cagle. Um, uh, Director Corey, could you just uh, give us an update on the the scheduling times? How far out of that? That was a big issue. It still is a big issue to many constituents. And I'd like to just Absolutely. get an update from you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I did um, a check just this morning and at least, you know, just examples of exam stations that have uh, that have uh, openings right away, um, you know, in, in February, we've got Anoka, Arden Hills, I'm looking at my list here, um, you know, Venona as early as uh, 2nd of March, we're looking at Bemidji has uh, um, openings as of today, tomorrow and day after, Egan has um, options of 23rd of February, Plymouth has an option, so we've got, we've got openings in in the next two weeks, we have openings in at least six to eight um, of the currently open exam stations. Are you able to just, uh, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Representative Krasnick. Um, do you, can you give us a number of how many openings in the next two weeks or do you not have it broken down like that? And then we'll move on. I don't so, want to monopolize the time here. Commissioner Corey. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. For example, Director Corey. I'm looking <laughs> Thank you, Rep uh, thank you, Chair, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Kosnick, I'm looking at my list in Duluth for the 23rd of February. That is uh, 24th of February. There are 30 appointments for tomorrow that are available today in, uh, in Duluth for tomorrow. Um, for tomorrow in the Virginia exam station, there are 13 appointments available. Uh, for tomorrow in the Cambridge exam station, there are three appointments available. Grand Rapids has five appointments available tomorrow. Uh, Moorhead has 11 appointments available. Um, St. Cloud has three appointments available tomorrow, 16 appointments available on the 26th. So those are just some examples. Thank you, sure. Director Corey. And we have just a few minutes left in this section. So um, we have Representative Elkins and then on deck is um, Representative Mason. So Representative Elkins. Yeah, thank you, uh, um, Chair and um, um, Director Corey. I, I want to just follow up on the, the line of questioning from Representative Petersburg. So if this is going to be the year that we make the big push uh, you know, to get people onto real ID, all of those applications have to be made in person. Uh, and I'm, I'm still not hearing that we're going to have the, uh, the, the, um, the capacity at the deputy registrar stations in order to handle that surge in demand for real ID applications. So Bloomington finally made a decision to, to permanently close its uh, deputy registrar station in order to eliminate a, a $300,000 a year deficit that that office was running. Uh, I know that the uh, the deputy registrars in general, are, you know, are barely hanging on with their their current fee structure. 
Uh, and you know, one of the, the the features of MinDrive was to you know push more of the work out to the point of customer contact, get the data right as it's entered there, in order for there to be less work uh, that needed to be done in the back room. And we haven't made any any uh, you know changes in the way we compensate the deputy registrars to um, you know to make sure that they're being uh, you know held whole for all of this extra work we're asking them to do. And I'm concerned that we're going to end up having additional deputy registrar closings all over the state, just as we need them to actually be adding capacity in order to handle real ID applications. Director Corey. Madam Chair, Representative Elkins, um, I, I definitely want to uh, share my sentiments on the fact that I look at our deputy registrars and our DL agents as an extension of our service, absolutely incredibly important to our service delivery model. We, in fact, as of yesterday, were working together on how we can make certain processes easier at the counter at our deputy registrars. I'll give an example. You talked about real ID. We, are, um, we have a system, when we think about improvements in Minnesota Drive, and enhancements, we have given our chairs of our deputy registrar organizations voting rights and ability to be able to add their priorities of enhancements to the system, never before. And so we have them at the table to make our systems and processes better because we have a common goal of better service for the customers. Now, I will agree that my staff and our deputy registrars, they all have this learning curve right now with the new system. But this system is going to make it easier and less time for all transactions as our staff get really comfortable with the system. So for Real ID, one of the things that we are putting in place right now is that you and me, if we want a Real ID, we can upload our documents directly into the MinDrive system so that they can be looked at by DVS. So when you go to the deputy registrar, now the deputy registrar doesn't have angry customers saying, why aren't you accepting our document? They can pull up their report and they will see those documents. So we're working on making it easier for the deputy registrars. It will get easier as the learning curve with the new system uh, you know, uh, takes its time. And, uh, but I, I completely agree that they are an incredibly important part of our solution model. So our support for them will continue. Our support and our uh, involve, allowing them to be involved in solutions will continue. Thank you. And I have to say, uh, um, Director, that um, all the deputy registers I've spoken with have been extremely complimentary of, of the uh, the, the cooperative working relationship uh, between your, your people and the deputy registrars in the development of MinDrive. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Elkins. Last question for this um, section is Representative Mason. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is to the director. There was one slide where you showed that the real ID uh, deadline is in October, but the amount for the money goes into 20 for 21 but the money is taken out of 22. So just trying to make sure I understand that. Director Corey. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Mason. Yes, um, if we have the funds for fiscal year 22, that means July 1 of this year, we will begin to be able to use those, that funding. And, and it was appropriated to us earlier, but of course, because of COVID, because we did not use it, it was canceled back to the fund. So we are basically just saying to reappropriate it to us, and it will be available to us for the crucial months of July, August, September, October, and as you know, into the next uh, into the next uh, few months post Real ID. And as we know, you know, travel starts, but travel will will progress over time. So we hope to have it for those crucial months starting July 1 of 2021. Thank you. So thank you very much, Commissioner Harrington, Colonel Langer, and Director Corey.